Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. Ow! What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. Okay, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? Let's do this. I'm in a car. I'm in San Francisco. I'm driving down Lombard Street towards the Golden Gate Bridge. As you know, I lived here for a couple years, but that's lost time. I have no idea what happened. I remember I had coffee, I smoked a lot of pot, did a lot of comedy, and uh, entrenched myself in a relationship that ultimately didn't work out. But that's neither here nor there. It's a beautiful day. It's clear. I'm heading towards the Golden Gate Bridge. I have a lot of memories here, but as I said before, they're foggy. But I always like the climate. It's gorgeous. I'm driving to Robin Williams' house to interview him. Now, you guys know, he's probably on the fame scale the biggest interview I've done. I've come in contact with him a few times over the years. We've had a few conversations. I get along with him. He's a very sweet guy when he sits down and talks. Uh, it's, almost, it's very disarming. And it's one of those situations where I have to think about myself. One of those situations. Is there any other kind of situation, Mark? I am guilty of, over the years, dismissing Robin Williams In the sense of like, you know, I've heard things about him, you know, he stole jokes, I don't know. But the bottom line is, as I get older, I realize this is a man that had the career that really any comic wants. I mean, if you want to look in retrospective, if you want to judge retroactively or or try to claim that your your judgment isn't bitter, then you can do that. But the bottom line is, is this guy was the biggest movie star in the world for a long time. He, you know, started as a comic. Went to acting school, fine. But but the truth of the matter is, by the time he was in his late 20s, 25, 26, 27, whatever that was, he was on a you know, a television show that was very popular, and then he parlayed that into an acting career on in movies, both serious and comic, which not many people do. Uh, and, and he sustained that career for upwards of 30 years. So there's really no way you can d- dismiss all of it. And, and the truth of the matter is, is, is that... No matter how cynical I may be, uh, you know, resentment plays a, a, a part in, in most of my judgments. And that if I'm going to belittle anyone's career, belittle anyone's talent, you know, 90% of the time, if they're popular, it's driven by resentment or my own self-pity. That's just a reality. I don't like to admit it, uh, but it's true. But the few times I've talked to Robin, it's, he's been incredibly uh, sweet and, and disarming. And, and then all of a sudden you're just filled with Robin. You know, you're sitting there and he's talking at you and you're you're just excited to have that small an audience with this guy. I have no idea how it's going to go, but I'm a little nervous. I Maybe I should look at it that way. Maybe, ooh, there's a Golden Gate Bridge. There's no way you can't see that thing from where I am right now and not think it's one of the greatest cities in the world. It's a fucking Golden Gate Bridge. And I'm about to be on it. Driving, not walking sadly to the middle with other intentions. That's a good sign. It's old school. It's like a classic stand-up mic. I made them up. Hey, hi. welcome back. I think it's going to be all right. So I, I appreciate you doing this, oh, and uh, it's fun. I was uh, I was Thanks nervous. Here. I was nervous coming up here. Why? I, don't, I usually don't get nervous. Why? I, I don't know why. You know, because <laughs> I've, I've, we've hung out before, we've talked before, but then at some point in my mind, I, I'm I'm getting ready to do this, and I'm like, I felt like I was interviewing a former president. I'm, I'm going. <laughs> I never knew. <laughs> it's going to be like the the Williams Marin interviews. These are yeah. going to be. This is going to go on for days. Wow. What 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 phone call? <laughs> Exactly. What did I do? It was I, a blackout. I remember. Was there a prostitute involved? <laughs> I don't know how long uh, you were you were drinking for in this in this little run you took, but I have to assume that driving home had to be an inspiration to stop. I only drove drunk, but then I remember once. And then one time I, I woke up the next morning and go, oh, where's my car? And, I, and it turned out the bartender had driven me home. He was a sweet guy and he drove me home. And and the next day I couldn't find the car. And I thought, oh my god, my car's been stolen. And they actually no, they parked it for me in a, in a safe parking lot. So <laughs> it's nice when people take care of you when you're that loaded. It's the benefit of uh, celebrity, I guess. Yeah, take more home. <laughs> I get a cinnamon kind, right? 
What? I guess I, now I can do this. <laughs> I walked home one time from a bar in Toronto, and I woke up the next to morning. here. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great yeah. blackout. I was two month walking, and I woke up the next morning with a a mitten, and I went, "Oh my God, this is a child's mitten." <laughs> oh no! And then the worst thought is the next morning. <laughs> that's the man. <laughs> and it turned out a waitress had given me her. She had tiny hands. And, and she'd give me her mitten because I'd lost a glove. But I would, that's the worst thing when you wake up going, what's this? There's a road flare. Oh, yeah. Or your car has got blood and hair on the fender. Yeah. And you're like, is that human? No, yeah. it's rabbit blood. <laughs> oh, thank oh, God. God. So I, I was doing some uh, some poking around, you know, because I, I, there, there's, a, there's a part of my comedy career that, uh, you know, where... You know, I spent time at the comedy store, and you know, you were this myth there at that time. Oh, totally. And you know, I started looking at stuff, and you know, I talk to a lot of younger comics now, and their history of comedy really starts at Mr. Show or maybe ten years ago. <laughs> and you know, when you mention Robin Williams or Pryor or, or Kennison or anybody, they're like, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know. I, I that was the crazy times because Sam, you know, Sam's first night up was just. I remember seeing who's the guy screaming. You know? Yeah. And supposedly Sam got on because he, he rescued Mitzi from Argus. Right, it was Argus Hamilton who was strangling her in a, some yeah, sort of drunk like, frenzy. And then, ah, oh, get away! Yeah, and yeah. Sam rescued her and then they put Sam on. My favorite nights were the nights that Pryor was working on Live on Sunset. The first one before he set himself on fire, the right. first stand-up. And you just, it'd be these weird nights where you just watch him. And then sometimes you get to go on after him once in a while, like he would, you know, have people come on stage with him, and then there'd be people in the audience like Willie Nelson would play music at the end after everyone split, and you go, "It's like jazz. It's pretty wonderful." But now, in your, did you did Pryor sort of take you under his wing somehow? I well, mean, he took everybody under his wing because he had that variety show that he had on. Uh, I think it was NBC. <laughs> and it was like his, the first show was amazing because he had he had this thing. He said, "It's pants up here." So he's, he's you know he's not wearing. You think he's just got his shirt off? And he goes, "Look at me. It's Richard Pryor." <laughs> I'm on TV. I didn't have to give up anything. I'm on NBC live. And then they pan down, and he's a Ken doll. He's got no genitalia. <laughs> and then after that, they started saying, you know, Richard, you can't do that, you know. And then he, by the time the last show aired, they said, okay, Richard, you, you, he, wouldn't, he was kind of angry at them. And he, they said, okay, just film me doing stand-up. And they said, oh, great. They filmed him for 45 minutes. They had 30 seconds they could use. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah, but it was like he had everybody. It was Mooney, Sandra Bernhardt, like everybody. He just hired all the comics to be like his players in this in this comedy troupe, and it was pretty wonderful. But it was, I think he just loved hanging out there, you know. And you know, you'd see him backstage. One night, somebody yelled out at him. They said, "Richard, do Mudbone." He went, "Fuck you! You do it. You know it better than me." And he did a piece one night that was the most beautiful piece I'd ever seen him do. He did a piece about. God coming back to Earth to pick up his kid. Uh huh. And he's going, "Where's my boy?" And then and he had everyone all the you know. And they go, "You want to tell him?" And he went, "I don't know. You know, get the Pope. He'll tell him." Go, Where's my son? Um, we killed him. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, we killed him, but he came back, and then he split, <laughs> and we haven't seen him. And then Pryor looked around and went, and then God was about, "I'm going to destroy him." And then all of a sudden, he took a moment, and went, "All right, that's it." I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I'm going to leave you love. And if you fuck that up, you're on your own. And they walked off stage. And you can see the entire audience go like, huh? What? Is it, what is they it? never did it again. But it was a weird kind of like, I just went, the most strangely beautiful piece. And the response of the audience was like, ta da That wasn't a character. No, yeah. that was just him. I love that kind of shit. It was wonderful. It's like those nights you see when you go on and someone says something so fucking wild and wonderful. And deep. Deep. So yeah. deep that even people in the audience are going, that's deep. Uh, I don't know how deep. to respond. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's too deep. It was. Yeah, I, that was one of the questions I was thinking of when I was coming down here is that, you know, despite whatever problems you had throughout your career, that I never sensed any animosity towards an audience. You can't be angry at them. I mean, I, was, I remember oh, wait, one you night. You can't. I, I, I can't. No. <laughs> but I can't. I mean, there's times when I've run across hostile audiences. Towards and, you? Yeah, I mean, but just because they're hostile towards everybody. I mean, right. I remember one audience one night, one night, years ago when I was on stage, they were sending up kamikazes, which was vodka and lime juice. Mm -hmm. And after about the third one, I realized, you want me to get fucked up? And I said it, and they went, yeah! And you want me to crash and burn? Yeah! And I was like, oh, fuck. It was, I went, oh, I get it. You Did you do it? it? No, I finally went, good night, because I went, I got to stop, because you really just want to see me pass out, don't you? And they were going, fuck yeah. You know, it's that weird... 
you know from hanging with Sam that they crash and burn, that's the way to go. Well, yeah. I mean, but that's the way I did it. And that's because I was trying to put into perspective, like, uh, you know, despite my own drug and alcohol problems throughout the years, they never garnered me, you know, any, uh, you know, if, if I was drunk or fucked up up there, I would go after an audience. I would blame them. I would, <laughs> you know, I would say, I, would, I have open shows by saying, what do you fucking want? Oh, what but- do you- Oh, uh, the worst case of that I saw was Keith Jarrett played uh, recently at uh, the Civic, uh, I guess at the concert hall, Symphony Hall, Davies Symphony Hall. And he's an amazing solo pianist and he plays his things, but he wants absolute quiet. And if you cough, he, has, he literally, after he finishes the piece, he goes, listen, <laughs> I don't, no. people don't cough when I play in my studio at home. Can you try? And he called it a, a failure in concentration. The Japanese don't cough. And, and then finally... He played this beautiful piece, and it got to a quiet part, and this woman went, <coughs> and you could see him literally go like this, and after, and then he went up to the mic again to start to tell, tell people, hey, that's not cool, and someone went, just play! <laughs> and I went, it was like, dance for me, black boy, it was like, and I, you could see him kind of go, and he walked off, and then he came back out, because he realized, wait a minute, I can't let you win. He could have, because in Italy, he told everyone to go fuck themselves, but he walked out on stage, and he said, okay, what do you want to hear? And they started yelling requests, and he played some beautiful, like, old standard. And then he played Somewhere Over the Rainbow, this jazz rendition, really beautifully. And at that point, even the hardcore were like, great, Al, I love you. Yeah. And then he did, you know, and he walked off stage and he got the first kind of... It was, and I think the, the hardcore, the people that are angry going, just play, they split. And then he did five encores, so by the fifth encore, it was just the people who knew, hey, and they were totally quiet, and it was so beautiful by the end. He had kind of done the Buddhist thing of rather than tell them to go fuck themselves, he said, what do you want? Like you said, he did what they wanted, and, the, and then the hardcore, the nasty, the, the entitled white people who are now picketing now today, uh, they were all, they split, and then what was left was the people go, I get it, we're sharing this experience. But it's like, you know, it's so weird. Well, sometimes you get an audience that's just like, the gift, and then other times you get, you know, the audience from hell. You know? I just don't uh, like. I don't. Uh, I don't completely understand the 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 non angry based comic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I guess what's hard to say when you know you've got like. There's not a lot for me to be angry at, you know. I, I guess that's true. I, I guess yeah, if when you, you start like a show, like especially when Mark and Mindy was on, uh, someone turned to me. He used to come out and just, you know, he'd say hi, and people go, "Ha ha!" I go, oh, "I haven't said anything funny." That's yeah. the scary thing is, there's that kind of, "Oh, you're famous, you're funny," but the weird thing is, what do you got to be pissed about? You know, it was like that weird thing. I used to joke, and I was 16 before I went to Europe. No, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> You know, don't you hate it when you have to walk to a private plane? Right, right. No, fuck, you know. How many people have problems with their maid? Yeah. Well, one of my houses, it's like when all of a sudden there was the Malibu fires and people are forced to leave their second home. I went, ain't life a bitch. Yeah, right. It's, it's like... Not I guess that's true. Of, it's, but it's weird, but you can still get angry with, like you said, ignorance or like just drunks. But being angry at a drunk is like bitch slapping a cow. It's not <laughs> really effective. Yeah. And I guess that's true. I mean, when did you do... How old were you when you did Mork? I mean... I was about 26. 29, 27, and that was crazy shit. You know, we, I'd go from, you know, doing the show and then come to do the comedy store and then go to the improv and then you'd go hang out at clubs and then, you know, end up in the hills in some Coke dealer's house, you know. Yeah, sure. Angel, it's Robin. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you'd wake up the next morning going, oh, and not wake up, you, you haven't gone to sleep and, you know, oh, you're I, like I a vampire remember. on a day pass going, how are you? <laughs> Yeah, and then you have to go do it again. Mm-hmm. You know, I have no regrets. I met a lot of interesting people, logged a lot of hours, you know, it's a few true. pirates. That you just like, I mean, you're, you're Robin Williams, and, and you're well, in this little... room with a guy who says he's a gaffer, some guy with an eye patch, and yeah. you're waiting for some other guy to bring shit that you don't even know where it came from. And the, if you're famous, most of the time you get it for free, which is weird. It's like it's like the same thing when you get gift baskets at award shows going, I don't need this stuff, thank you. But a lot of coke dealers go, here, dude. Yeah, we love you. We want to see you die. You want to see you die? I don't want to get you high because it's it's part of our advertising campaign. I got robbed and loaded. Yeah, they uh, yeah, and they like being connected to you. And it's it's part of the whole thing of a little dust for you, and then you'll spread the word and other celebrities. And eventually, if they get busted, then they could subpoena you. Right, but also they get to hang out with you big time. Then and, and then, then they realize, can... Jesus, on coke, you're a boring fuck. You know, oh. you look out the window a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. I, I do. <laughs> but, know, there's ninjas coming up the wall. <laughs> yeah, ninjas, but, and maybe yeah, just well, cops. I mean, yeah. What are you doing? What's that noise? It's a, it's a spider. But that Hollywood Hills thing, then I can't even imagine what it was like because by the time I was there with Sam, I mean, it seemed like the wave was crashing. I mean, he was the most demonic manifestation of of that scene. I mean, shit, you were there. You were like, I had to bail him out once. I had to go. I think it was one of the houses, I don't know if you lived there, but one of the houses, he trashed a house and they were going to take him to court, so I ended up paying 
the cleaning deposit. And another time he, he did it to a hotel room in New York, and they're about to take him away, and I ended up saying, okay, I'll, I'll cover your hotel bill. But it was weird, that whole kind of, you know, throwing TVs out the window. You're going, this old school. Yeah. Know, this old English rock. But is it necessary? That fucking did it. <laughs> yeah. Why are you doing that? <laughs> exactly. <Don't> that. <laughs> Shitting on the carpet. <laughs> yeah, taking it, you know. What are you doing? <laughs> Took a dump on your RV. <laughs> Fuck off. Well, you were there. Were you there during it? it I was gone when he was doing that. No, I know, because I was there. Yeah, and, you and were there. there, was just, there were, there was talk of you. The, yeah, he'd gone. He'd, yeah, yeah. At that point, I moved back up to Napa. It was like I. But done. you'd been clean then, by then, weren't you? I mean, the first I had twenty years sober before I relapsed recently, and it was like, it was that whole thing about my son being born. It was just like, fuck, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's just. Well, I remember you did material on that about having the kid and having it be like Coke and. Yeah, it's like you're awake, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you haven't slept, you're, you smell like shit and piss. Well, what know? the hell do you think happened this time? What brought you out? I mean, what it brought was, me, what, what made me relapse? I was up in Alaska in a place. Enough was, said. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, who's up there? People in witness protection? You can go to a bar and say, I nice can drink. tooth. Yeah. It's another planet. Oh, yeah. Even when I was drinking there, the, even the bartender went, I, heard, I thought you were sober. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Can you keep and I secret? started drinking with like the tiny little bottle of Jack Daniels, like the little ones you get in the airplane. Yeah, yeah. And I thought this is fine. Yeah, it's a small. And bottle. a week later, I was hiding them, you know, a big bottle of Jack Daniels, and just like, fuck. yeah, it went quick. It, and it was, and it was just being in Alaska. What were you doing up there? This movie called The Big White, and just totally, just thinking, what am I doing here? This is crazy. And then and feeling kind of like isolated, and all of a sudden went, well, there's one cure. And all of a sudden you feel, I feel warm after this. And then it was just so fucking quick. Were you I, publicly drunk? A couple of times, yeah. A couple of times the people had to kind of go, maybe you should go home now. You know, it's nice. It's like, I think you said this once at a cook dealer actually said, that's enough. Yeah, sent me home. Yeah, they yeah. used to, like, I was like, that's what do when I do? they, when you know you're fucked up, when your dealer's going, I think you yeah, gotta stop. You gotta right go. Now. At least for the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they start talking that shit yeah, to you. Yeah, it's yeah, time you to gotta go. clean up your act. And then it was three years of just, and denying, and, the whole myth that uh, with alcoholics that vodka doesn't smell till you sweat. Oh yeah, and it's, then, it's and so then you just start acting out and acting out and acting out and acting out, and then until eventually, I was in Cannes at a fundraiser, on stage, uh, you know, just drunk off my ass. And I looked up and I went, "Oh, that's a wall of cameras. That's kind of cool." And I went, <laughs> at this point, you're going, you just, "Why don't you just take a shit on the stage, and then people might notice." What are you doing? Oh, that's a fucking crazy shit. And you're not really the kind of guy where they're like, ah, it's Robin. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, at that point they're going, oh. Whoa, this isn't good. Oh, Opie's, Opie's doing crack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can't be. And did, do you think it was some, do, you can really, I mean, I know, you know, drinking is just drinking in the, in the mindset. No, no, I think it's, it's trying to fill the hole and it's fear and you're kind of going, what am I doing in my career? And you start thinking, you know what would be great at this point? Rehab. But it's the idea of just you bottom out. Yeah, you, you felt a, a sort of emptiness and a fear of, of where time. you go next. Yeah, Where do you go next and what am I doing? And rather than kind of go, okay, you, this will pass, you go, no, this will pass, it'll pass quicker. But it's, it's so interesting to me that, you know, you have these experiences and, you know, I mean, you're an international superstar. Well, I, that I mean, shit fades, though. So. You know, the weird thing is people say, you have an Academy Award. The Academy Award lasted about a week and then one week later people go, hey, Mork. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, God. So you're back and it's like, all that stuff, you know. It's you still there. get that? You don't get that anymore. Mark, oh, God, yeah. Once Come on. In, once in a while, just because it's on Nickelodeon or you get people kind of go, that's the memory bank. It's a show like that is in people's, like, a Kishik memory. Does that, that bother you? No. I go, it paid for the ranch. It yeah. paid for the house. It, right. And it was great experiences. I got to meet wonderful people, and it paid a lot of bills and kicked my career way in the ass. Don Marrero said, without that, where the fuck would you be? I would go, you're right. Did he say that recently? No, that was about, oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it was that weird fucking thing of, yeah, you have all this stuff, but the weird thing, the only sanity clause, that sounds like a Marx but hey, that's, I don't believe in a sanity clause. <laughs> the idea is going on stage is the one salvation. Now, how long did you stay away from stand-up? I mean, you Not never long, really... I mean, it would come and go. It became, like after, like the 2002 tour came after 9-11. It was literally... We were doing this Mark Twain Award in Washington, and and it was like I think almost a month after 9/11, and people were kind of going. You could see that there was just like almost like lifting a siege, and you went, "Oh Jesus, man, it is good to get back out and do this shit," you know? Oh and yeah, then, I mean, I saw you at Stand Up New York a, a couple of times. That's why I love going on there, and it's a very small place. We're at the Comedy Cellar, and like uh, I mean, you you know, I mean, your desire to connect and your 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 style. 
like like you were saying before, there's this weird thrill where the people they see you get the but take then the thrill wears off, and then you got to find stuff. and then yeah, you got to get in it. Yeah, and we and were talking about that before uh, at the comedy store that the honesty where you're at your point in, the, in your life now where you're at the age you're at now and you're having the experiences you're at now I mean it takes some balls to really deal with that stuff to deal with it I mean I am, I'm not to the point where Pryor could talk about it in so fucking deep that, you know that, but that's your inspiration yeah in my inspiration and with the people I see doing I mean you talk about it honestly Chris Rock Chris did the most amazing thing recently he said you know it's weird all of a sudden uh, if, you, if you get a, if, a sexual you know if you cheat on your wife everything is a felony first degree but that should be like, if you get a blowjob in Georgia from a stewardess, that should just be a misdemeanor. <laughs> if you fuck a best friend, that's a felony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you go like, have you turned this routine for your wife? He went, not yet. Right. But it's that balls about what can you talk about? Isn't it funny? The balls is not, it's not relative to, to, uh, transgressing any cultural taboos, but it's like, well, I don't know if she'll take that shit. <laughs> time. Those are the real balls. Like, <laughs> they you know, really when, are. When you come home to that, you know, mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Even okay. if you've only been dating them two months. Big yeah. time. And you go, well, can she tolerate that shit? And then you can't pull that thing. It's like, it's my act. It's not your act. We, I was with you when that happened. That was us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was me. <laughs> that thing when you look like you're going down on a girl, that's what you look like. Uh, yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's the scariest part. It's also people when you do like jokes about famous people or anybody and then, then you run into them. What's well, fan word? It never forgave me for something. Serious? Kind of. I mean, I did this joke where I used uh, as a descriptive, you know, like I, I mocked Adam Sandler fans. And then I run into him at the improv one night and he's like, I hear you're talking about me. And I'm like, yeah, I did on television. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got to like, get over it. Yeah. He's like, what's your problem? Uh, and I'm like, dude, you're a cultural icon. At some point, we can't, you know, I mean, you don't I'm, get immunity. You well, know. I'm in no bit position. Like, you know, it's not like I have any cachet. You know, I'm still able to make those kind of mistakes. My, the liability for me is like, well, you're not in the group. You know, you, you know, oh, you will be famous. excluded. Yeah. yeah and, and, and or also sick, that yeah. you'll never get in now, you fuck. <laughs> But that's all right. Get in. <laughs> do you want in? No, like, no. Like approach your mark said, do you want to be a member of a club that would have you as a member? It's no, like, no. It's a fucking frightening thing. I mean, one time I was doing this thing, I was, and it was a benign impression of Stallone, you know, as being monosyllabic. And Billy, Billy Crystal leaned over and went, he's here. And I went, hi. Yeah. How are you? And then you got to go, then you got to deal with so it. How did he deal with it? He was funny. It's not that. He's not saying like, well, like what Bobcat said that during the Vietnam War, he was teaching Jim to Swiss schoolgirls. That he was a little upset with that. And he said, I'll if you actually him. attack their character. Yeah, if you attack their character and said, you know, actually go after a real hardcore personal point, then they get like, oh, I'll kill you. You fuck. How do you take it when people it, kind it's of hard. Or you, It hurts, but then you realize, and, and you, what do you do for a living? I make fun of people. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, uh, I guess you have to get Buddhist and say, you're, you're there, dude. Like you said, you're in, you're in the mix. When you fuck up, you're in the mix. Like, yeah, like a week ago. I did this thing on Letterman, and I thought, this is pretty benign. I'd just come back from Australia, and he said, how's Australia? He said, no, Australians are like English rednecks. And cut to, I get, I land in L.A., and they said, the Prime Minister of Australia was offended by the remark. He basically said, perhaps Mr. Williams should spend some time in Alabama before he calls someone a redneck, which triggered the governor of Alabama to call the Prime Minister of Australia and said, you know, we're, uh, people in, in uh, Alabama are decent, hardworking people. In other words, we're not rednecks either. Now he's campaigning against Australia to get yeah, it. Now then they have a linguist. Yeah. Yeah, they go, oh, now, now you don't ever call us that. Like, good day, now what are you saying? No. And it was just weird to go, oh, wow, I pissed off a prime minister. That's this weird thing. But then it was like, then I went on Australian radio going, oh, I was talking linguistically. If, if you combine an English accent and a good old boy, you get this. You know, if you go, hello, good to see you. And hey, how are you? You get, hi, good eye, y'all. And it's just weird. That was the joke? The joke was, I didn't even say that joke. That was the joke I did. That wasn't spin? You were trying to... I didn't. I was trying to spin it back. <laughs> so I don't get, you know, land in Australia and get a cavity search. Hi. You know, Roman, step back here. Don't be afraid. We're putting on an oven mitt. When I talked to... Uh who, yeah, it's very coincidental, but I, I, I actually uh, had Steve Pearl in my hotel room yesterday. Fucking hey, he said that we, he's been so wonderful to see him back here and so sane again. And he's he really be funny as shit because he got so dark when he lived in L.A. I know, and that's how I knew him. That's when you I knew met him. You knew him in the dark, dark Stephen. Well, like that's what's... The anti-Steven. And it's now he's still fucking hilariously funny. But it's like he's 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 got a girlfriend and he's up here and he's, he's away happy. From the, he's away from the black hole. Yeah, 
And he's and the black hole in himself seems to have filled in a little oh, bit. Oh, big time! He's, he's happy. chipper and it's like oh, sparky. But he's still like he's fucking. He does the same. I'll tell you right now, Richard. Yeah. And he does all these. And he's like you see him at the Throckmorton, and he's like he kicks ass. And it's just going, is he killing? Killing. Well, that was the interesting thing because, like, you know, in the San Francisco, like, uh, in, in, I get a lot of comedy nerds that listen to this show, and they're they're sort of a, an elite bunch. Some of them. That must be a weird group. Well, they just are this weird. Out, just this side of comic people. Well, yeah. it, well, exactly. But they've sort of latched on. I think it started, you know, you know with Mister Show with uh, Bob and Dave, and they, you know, there there's a sort of intelligentsia element to it. Well, uh, people who know, I found, and, and they also think people like finding, you know, young comics are finding. I found uh, they find niche comics that they go, I found this guy. No one knows. Well, about that's him. what it is. Is. It's a, there's a whole community around that. Like you performed at the UCB, I think a couple of times. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, and that that's sort of like you know ground zero of that's that. That's ground zero for weird, strange, like kicking it comedy. Well, that's well, that's like the analogy I was trying to make and trying to talk to Pearl when I could talk to him. You know, with, when I was. <laughs> When I wasn't being, well, you were swimming you know, upstream. When b- being bombarded with the history of civilization in small fragments. Yeah. Uh, was that, you know, San Francisco, I guess in the late 70s and early 80s, when you guys were here, uh, really defined a, a type of comedy. And I don't think people really talk about it that much. And I, I think that, that you and Pearl were sort of at the center of what became uh, a well, riff there style. There were people. There was him, Pearl. There was Paula Poundstone. There was all these weird, uh, A. Whitney Brown, or now as he says, the Whitney Brown. There's all the, and Dana Carvey, and, and a lot of, because it had weird clubs. Bobby like, Slayton. I mean, there were the Jews, old Jews. Yeah, yeah. Jews and Chinese. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Godzilla versus. Yeah, yeah. Ah, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> the battle of the ancient cultures. <laughs> Give me the mo. I want the mo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta think of the clubs, you know, kind of brought that out, like the Holy City Zoo, which is a weird kind of wine bar next to a hardcore rock and roll bar, or the other cafe located near. Yeah, the streetcars are going by. All of a sudden, you'd be doing a show and ding ding, and then you'd see the weird people getting off. And and it was that the other cafe, uh, some cobs when it was down in the marina, weird clubs that kind of brought out weird styles. And it seemed like the community in San Francisco sort of indulged your indulgence. Totally, they were. Totally you can't do it anywhere else. No, I mean, I think you're right. It was a, an eclectic mix, you know, that and allowed, you know, like. Weird comedy like Freaky Ralph, who eventually set himself on fire. To close? No, to, to end his life. Oh, no, I'm so close. <laughs> yeah, that's the ultimate closing. But seriously, I'll be here till five minutes from now. God, man, you're killing yourself. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Yeah, to close, only a comic would go. To close? How did you see the first and second it's not, show? It's not, it's not an opener. Oh, God. So the style that you like. Mine was just based on the fact that I didn't use a mic. Because uh, if you want mic, if they I, if I can go off mic, and also wading into these clubs is the only way to kind of you know wait. If people started heckling, you just wade over into the audience and kind of go in near their table or move away from them and use the other side of the room and fuck the loud people over here and the drunks at the bar. So you're you uh, from and the beginning, cause right? The, and just playing off a of shit that was going on or just trying to go. Okay, what's uh, coming in with some ideas, but not like good evening, ladies and gentlemen. One of the great. Strange performers at that time was Jeremy Kramer. There's an eclectic name. That Jeremy would go on and just do loud, wonderful characters. He was like the West Coast Gilbert Godfrey. Right. And he would be like, Lau! Yeah. Hi, everybody! Yeah. And he would do, you know, weird, kind of wonderful, strange characters that literally, if people would love him or drive people out of the room, there was no middle ground. Well, that was there was some integrity to that at a certain point in time that Big people time. left. You know, but when, so, when like, Gilbert would do the entire rock opera of, of Tommy as Jerry Lewis... That's a ballsy move till he'd empty the room and the only person left was Larry David. Yeah. You know, that's when you go, that's yeah. commitment. Yeah. And, and I think that there's still something to be said for that. You don't see people with that much balls anymore. I think it does take a certain amount of balls to cut that type of territory on cut stage. Cut that type of territory and realize, or, or, <laughs> like Lenny Schultz in the middle of one time, and this is the strangest name in comedy, you know, giant Lenny, steroid pumped up Lenny on stage doing a children's showcase for uh, Nickelodeon. Uh huh. And at one point he realizes this isn't going well, and then he t- pulls out a double-headed dildo. How's this for your fucking kids? <laughs> and then starts playing, playing it with playing turkey in the straw with a double-headed dildo and going, oh, this is when you go. That's comedy. That's comedy. Yeah, that's, that's the, the nature. That's the real stuff. That's the business, yeah. my boy. Well, that, that's interesting, though. So you from you know you come out of Juilliard doing it. You, you did stand up. I left up. school. I fell in love with this girl. I did you finish? Uh, no, I didn't finish. I was, they they even wanted me to finish, and they kept saying, "Come back." And I went. I fell in love with this girl, moved back here, couldn't find acting work, and one day went, what, there's a weird comedy workshop, and, you know, because I'd done a lot of... What year are we talking? 
Probably 76. Uh-huh. Or, yeah, three years of Julia, you know, probably maybe even 75. And just doing this comedy workshop in the basement of the Intersection Coffee House. And then all of a sudden, there was they had a night of lesbian poetry and stand-up comedy, which is a great audience to begin with. Sure. Because you know they're going to like you just being a man. A man, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of love there. Yeah. <laughs> Big male penis violence. <laughs> but it was weird. And starting with that, and then this weird kind of comedy thing of one, a lot like the, the zoo had one night of comedy. And there, a lot of clubs at that time were kind of going, we'll try a night of comedy. Whereas in the eighties, everything, every di- every disco, every other club had a you know a comedy night. But I think that whole no mic thing really defines you know still that because uh, uh, when I go off mic, the the control you have of a room changes dramatically. Totally, people are forced to kind of go what? Yeah, they're like take it in, and so you were able to sort of like. You but know, I know guys who do that. You know who really. That's why when I do stand up, I, I use a wireless mic. I just I don't. This is hard for me to go. Okay, good evening, thanks. And it, it seemed to me almost old school to go. Hi, everybody. Nice to be holding here. Mic. Grab, holding the mic. And when I've had to go do clubs where I do, I kind of I leave it in the stand and kind of come and go to it. It's almost like a, oh, come back. Point of reference. Come back. But it was also the thing. I got to move. A moving target, literally. And you still like you know you still like put it out there, man. I mean, you got to. For me, and the reason like when we go on at the comedy cellar. Uh, it's therapy. It's a, it's a it's it's a relief from that shit, like you said, of this this weird thing of the celebrity and all that other crazy shit, where you can go on stage and especially like you go on stage late, and like you said with an audience, it's kind of especially, I don't know. There's certain audiences where they go, okay, so it's something new, right? And they're they're a little beaten up. If you go on late, you know, and it's half they're a beaten house up, and, and then they're, they're going. And then you know, if you find something new, it's new. Then it's new and also different, or really honest, or really like you said, deep, or just fucking crazy shit. But I think the personal truth, you know, becomes more daunting. I, I to me, yeah, for me, it's a difficult thing to well, do. Well, you know, it's like if you want to, you know, you know, pontificate or, or 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 take a soapbox, which I've done plenty of in my life, and I'm just at this point, and I'm, I'm a little younger than you, where it seems to me that the real risk, the one thing that all of us share, is that existential you know fear that you know the panic of you know what does it really all fucking mean Big time. uh you know what do we do with this anger uh and and what do you I, do with the anger and what do you do with the b- beneath the anger is the fear like you said what's the fear yeah and, 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 and you i talk think about that and you talk about it to a 20 something and they're going because they're they're like um, immune at that point well yeah i do a bit about how like i've, I've gotten old enough to uh to resent people for being young <laughs> Like and, and and I'll ask someone in the audience how old are you and if they go like twenty two I go uh, you know fuck you you're twenty two you think you got life by the balls and I tell them I say you do you do have life by the balls but what you don't realize is that the cock of life is planted firmly in your ass and you're just helping it along <laughs> and they don't really know what to do with that because there's no way they can like they can't fathom that well I do the the podcast you know who can fathom it there's this like I get emails from fourteen to eighteen year old guys saying you know I really understand where you're at the frustration all this stuff and then when they get about 20 uh, you know 20 to 35 which is the prime demographic I got nothing for them but you know 18 <laughs> 14 to 18 year old kids they understand the fear and the pain and everything oh else and then God. the cocky time comes and then when you get in your mid 30s they're like oh now I get it so I've alienated the only profitable demographic I'm, I'm very clever like that you're basically 18 to 25 nothing fuck off yeah yeah that's why I wanted to talk about Twitter to me I go Twitter why would I Twitter, the next step for me is stalker. You know, I'm having lunch. I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm right near the table near you. Well, there's, but, a, there's yeah. a, a website where they say, uh, you know, where, you know, people are Twittering so much that, you know, for criminals, they're like, well, he's not home. He just told us they he wasn't home. And they talked about it in the news and went, great. Even now, they, now you're giving them even more of a clue. What the fuck? Like, yeah, they, look, I'm having lunch. Yes, yeah. so yeah. fucking A. Yeah. We're at your house. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the stuff. Yeah, and your dog is not here. <laughs> So, well, how do you now? Like I noticed, and now with the with the last one, the weapons of mass self destruction was that what it was? Yeah, Weapon, that you are taking you know more risks than you have before with your own life and your I yourself. Am, but it's also you know it's that weird thing of still talking kind of in general terms versus hardcore specific terms, which is like that thing that you leave either for. Th- at one point, I had a therapist go, "Are you comfortable talking about this?" I went, "Maybe," you know. It's that idea of. Like I told you with Chris, he was talking about stuff. And I went, wow, would that I had the balls, you know. But at the time, I was in the middle of a divorce. You're going, not good. Initially, I was going to call the tour, remember the alimony. And they went, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Not until we get not the paying paper signed. <laughs> <laughs> you're not paying alimony, number one. Number two, not profitable. And the idea of... Well, that's bitter. There's a line where... Yeah, I mean, someone said recently that they saw John Cleese who was going through this divorce. And he was on stage, and he was so angry that the audience at one point was like, stop, you know. 
Right, because bitterness is not, I tried to sell it for a long time, and it's really just amplified self-pity. Totally. And, and it reads that way. And people kind of go, I get it, but you move on, you know. Right, like, that's, that's the weird thing about people, is that, you know, <laughs> they're going, if it's, if you can talk, it's that old acting thing. The more personal you make it, the more, the, and the more specific you make it, the more people will relate to you, because they'll go, as personal as you think it is, there's a lot of people going, I feel that. Well, that's how that's where you get them. But you know, where where to get that in comedy is is a little trickier. Yeah, because you walk over that line and going, I feel this, and I want to I want to burn, and you go, No, no, we don't feel that. You know? Right, right, exactly. Or they go, Don't share that part. Well, then you have to you know, accept that idea that where they can, you know, where either they laugh with you or they laugh at you. At some point, you have to be comfortable <laughs> if they're no, laughing at you. You're comfortable with either one of laughing at you. Can you can you can you tolerate that? And that's maybe sometimes where I go. Oh, go! You know the insecure part goes. No, no. What do you What are you afraid will happen? I guess it's that fear of you'll recognize that the you know as you know how insecure are we really? Yeah. How desperately insecure that we that made us do this for a living? Well, I just I went to your IMDb page and and over the the twenty five years of of uh, appearance changes, I think that they <laughs> big time going. Why are you the beard? You have a beard. You have a beard. You're fat. You're clean. You're thin. You're like you're blonde hair. You're bald. It's that weird thing, but those are a lot of times for characters, but it's the idea of at what point, you know, what level of acceptance, like you said, and and look what we do for a living in, in terms of stand-up. You get to do stuff that if you did it, you know, just on the street, people go, that man. Yeah. You talked about his penis to me openly. Right. And you're going, but you're doing it in a club, all of a sudden there's license to thrill, that old thing, you can do this stuff. But, like you said, the line, stepping over and back over the line of like, what are you going to find out? You're going to find out that you know you're this weird, insecure guy who does this and looks and looking like Lenny Bruce said for love. Going, do you love me? Yeah. Temporarily. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And then and and can you put that at risk? Going, I don't care if you love me. I got to say this shit. And that's why I guess sometimes you can go, is that an artist or or is that a sociopath? Yeah. Who or a psychopath? Who well, let's a not fuck. make labels. Let's not call. <laughs> I'm not going to label him. In fact, he stabbed that penman. But it, you he's know, genius. You know, he did genius. He's a good man. That's What's a Norm- his name? Buddy Hitler. Yeah, that's the Norman Mailer School. Oh. He can write that guy. Who cares oh if he boy! Later? God bless him. Yeah. But do you find that? You, do you really feel like you like when you grew up? Uh, because like my relationship with my parents sort of defined you know who i am and it Mine was too but like my were your parents absent no my father when i was young he was off he, he was a vice president of lincoln mercury so like a sales division so he was all over the midwest he'd come back and i know he'd come back because all of a sudden there'd be like this new corgi toy he'd be like i brought you back a little yeah. like a thing it was like cool you were only child yeah and i have two half brothers one i found out later on for a long time they told me he was my cousin it's a bit like nicholson going Lauren's your cousin. Then when I got to be 12, I went, no, actually, he's your half-brother. It's like, you know, I felt like Nichols should walk in. What is it? Is your brother or your cousin? And then, you know, my mother, very, very, really funny, terminal optimist. Everything is wonderful, beautiful. My father is, you know, the hardcore pessimist, you know. I asked when I told him I wanted to be an actor, he said, great, have a backup profession like welding. But it was like, between the two of them, I got this weird kind of... Not cynical, but hyper realism and this hyper optimism of my mother of like everything is rainbows and beauty, and a bit like Tom Cruise, all you need is vitamins and exercise, and then you'll be fine. Right. Even when I'm addicted to coke, that'll, we can get you through that. By That's the, vitamins. Yeah, <laughs> vitamin C, yeah. Colombian calcium. <laughs> but it was like between the two of them, you get this weird desire to connect with her using kind of comedy and entertainment, and you know, and my father about you know look at the world realistically, be hardcore, you know. You know, this is, that pony's going to shit sometime. There, I guess there was this old, I don't know who said this years ago, your mother knows how to push your buttons because she installed them. Right. You know, and yeah. I used to have this pillow that my mother saw that said, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. And she was, what does that mean? I went, I don't know, mom. Yeah. What, what do you want it to mean? See, them or the wife, someone's going to, you know. Someone's going to get like, oh. So how, because it seems like you're, you're, you're back on the scene, you know, doing stand up regularly. Yeah. And you've got the big, how do you deal with the bitterness of your peers and and what they direct at you because you know the you know, things are said in the community yeah you know. i mean a lot of it's old school and a lot of it's true from the way past but you know i don't hang out in the in the community i mean the community up here is pretty mild compared to down there i mean in new york i feel safe la i get kind of like oh, well, what about know. the whole like you know i mean i would be remiss if i didn't address it because it, it's something that i i want to talk to you about and and it, it's something i hear all the time and i think it's demeaning the, this whole stealing issue 
I think in the old days, it was if you hang out in comedy clubs when I was doing almost 24-7, you, you hear things, and then if you're improvising, you all of a sudden you repeat it going, oh, shit. Right. That's the way your brain works. My brain was working yeah, yeah, that yeah. way. And, now I went, and then I went. I literally had to go through a period where I went, I'm not going to hang out anymore. I can't because I don't want to get into that thing. And I was also like the bank of comedy. I went, oh, shit, here, here you go. Here's money. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Oh, shit. I'm Is sorry. that how you dealt with it? Well, I, just I mean, just paid shitloads of cash. I was just like, here you go. I'm sorry. And then... And then after a while, I went, I bought that line already, I saw it. And then they have to pay again. I went, oh, fuck, I'm sorry. So just guys so who would like, come up to you and say... Well, say, you know, I do that. And I went, go, but so does everybody. Right. It's like there's other stuff that's common material. And sure. And there's other things that go, fuck, you're right. I'm sorry, I heard that. And then it was like, okay. And then I went, I can't hang out in here anymore. And then it took literally going... When I go here to the Throckmorton, I'll see friends and I can hang out like with Overton. Sure. Or you see Steven and all these other guys, and it's like, oh, cool, I'm okay. That's why it's kind of like living up here, I don't worry about it. In New York, I go, I can go on and hang up upstairs in the restaurant and not, and then go on stage. I don't want to sit down and watch comics all the time. But, you know, in the old days, yeah, there was that whole thing about just going from club to club to club. It's one of my, people, yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of people that was like, you would say, like, there were styles, and you're like, but he's doing him. I go, yeah, it's Sandra Bernhardt's doing Taylor Negron. Yes. You know, you go, like, at that point, you're going, look at the blending. Well, that behind every genius, there's a guy going, he stole my soul. Fucking A. But it's that whole thing of what's the bitterness versus do you want to hang out, do you engage it? And you say, what's the truth of it? Yeah, I know the truth of the old days, but now it's like, I don't hang, so I don't know. Well, that's know. the weirdest thing is that, like, there's this idea that when, when you have show business, which is just a community uh, of bitter people aspiring to something, <laughs> and, 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 and they're children because what they're aspiring to is ridiculous. And, I mean, you've had a, <laughs> you've had a tremendous career for, for a lot of reasons, but there's a lot of people that, you know, that they just, they go to Hollywood. I used to do a line where I said it took me years to realize Hollywood wasn't my parents. That you, you, you go wow, to. Wow, looking for approval. Well, yeah, it's just like I'm here. Where's my, where's my trail? Uh, and, and, and I think that the bitterness that when, when people dismiss somebody who's had a, a career, you know, as big and huge as yours, that the idea that, like, you know, if he didn't take that one joke, he wouldn't be Robin Williams. I mean... It's ridiculous. I mean, you look at even you look at someone like Pryor, who literally did Cosby for the first two well, years well, of his before life. Before the auteur theory of comedy happened in the late 50s, where comics actually owned their point of view, I mean, it was what people did. I mean, you know, Jerry, you know the, oh, the yeah. worst belt guys were like, are you doing that bit about the uncle tonight? Yeah. Can I do it? All right. And, I, yeah, I'm open it and, and it was interchangeable. It's also the idea of... You know, common ground when you say, when there's certain fucking subjects you go, you talk about, are you talking about the president? Fuck, I talk about the president. Oh. Well, yeah, well, there's a difference between like, uh, um, it's But a not joke, joke. A joke, joke. And you can get why it's a crafted thing going, if someone does a joke, joke. Right. But then there's also jokes that are so fucking public domain. That's right. Public domain just happens. Yeah. How can everyone not? There's yeah, 10,000 comedians. We're all drawing from the same reality pool. Give yeah, you're like, okay, you got the Olympic That's, joke. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Stop masturbating. Why? Because I'm trying to examine you. <laughs> it's like these things. And, but it's for, the, but then the truly unique guys don't give a fuck. Sure. They're just and, like, well, I won't do it anymore. But if you, no one ever accused Andy, you know, Kaufman, because he was so strange. That right. Yeah, you know, just going, he's a genius. I went, yeah, fucking A. What were some of the, did you know him well? Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to someone the other day. I only had one conversation with Andy where he wasn't talking to me as a character. And I went, and, you know, I went and to And what was that, like, were you concerned? <laughs> Not at all. He just went, hi, Robin, I, uh, how are you? I went, good, Andy, how are you? Really good, I'm, I'm just here buying something. At, it was at some health food store. And then, by the end of the conversation, slowly but surely, he went back to this. And I went, okay, I'll see you. Take care. And that was that? Yeah. What were some of the most uh, you know, powerful moments you know, for you, in, 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 either in movies or just with people? Like, I, I know, I mean, you've, you've worked with everybody. Where, where you were like, you know, that's who this guy is. I, I never, you know, like De Niro or Pacino or, you know, or Pryor or any of those. <laughs> that's a great moment with De Niro. We're shooting Awakenings and we're... We're, you know, we're doing a scene where I'm taking him to the Bronx. He's on the medication, and we're taking him in a car in the yeah. Bronx for the first time out of the hospital. We do one take, and I'm driving around for another setup, and all of a sudden, this old black wino sees him in the front seat and yells out, "Hey, Bobby, you still like black pussy?" <laughs> <laughs> And then all of a sudden we give him rolling. And he's just like, mm. he's laughing so hard that it's just like, oh my God. But my other favorite moment is uh, with Jeff Bridges. We're, in, we're shooting a scene and something screws up. And he says to me, he said, it's okay. It's a gift. If something screws up, you know, it's like the idea that it's a gift. Don't be afraid of it. You know, it's like that idea of every time when you're making a movie, that forces you to make something special that you didn't plan. To and get it real. Yeah, so real, but also, you know, you're in that moment. 
and you're forced to deal with it and deal with it together with the other actor. And with him, it was a blast because you're like, you know, you're playing off of someone who's so good. That's why when he won, finally, it was like, dude, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's high time. He deserved it so many oh, other times. Oh, big time. You know, he's one of those guys who's just like cranking away, doing great work, and finally went, no, take anything off the top shelf. Yeah. You know, the bottom line for me with comics, and like you said, about the bitterness or whatever, you just realize it's the world, and you also start to realize, I, I know it's out there, but I still enjoy doing this. I still enjoy performing, and you know, say what you say, it's all right. It, does it still, does it kind of sting sometimes? Fuck yeah, but it's also, I still love doing this. I'm not going to stop, because all of a sudden you're going, you fucking hack. I went, I may be, but I love doing it. You know, I like, and I, I occasionally I'll find something and I'll go, um, I think it's good, and I'm getting more... Like, when you see you, like you said, you go through your bitter phase and you come out the other side and you go, I just want to talk about this shit. Yeah. The, the thing is, is like about all that, you know, how people define comics and, 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 and their bitterness, the, the, the consistency that you have to light up a fucking room. But just to, I mean, just to go on and just to try to light it up. And people room. are just sitting there waiting, when's Robin going to, you know, open it up? And then, you yeah. know, you always deliver it. Is that something you, is well, that? Well, for me, it's a fun thing to say, open it up is the idea. That's the operative word to say, if that's what you're looking for, to go, to find that moment where you can, like, you get it. And then when you don't get to open up, it's a bit like, okay, didn't get that moment tonight, but maybe you will. It's like, it's like open field running for a running back. Well, all of a sudden, there's the, there's the hole. They, they broke through and then <laughs> yeah, you can yeah, do yeah. it and you found it I've seen you do that too where you look and you got an idea I think it's the idea of why do we do it because it's there but it's also that's still that same desire that started off going love me but now it's into something uh, I'm okay I'm gonna still do it you know? the one thing I'm trying to get rid of is that it starts with love me and then I'm like do you still love me now <laughs> <laughs> well, I love you did the thing about you said the thing about our old Jesus if he'd lived oh yeah bitter Jesus uh, bitter Jesus in the water Maybe up to his ankles I used, I used to be able to walk well that's a but it's like an amazing you know, gift that I, I don't really you know like when people talk about stand up like I don't know where it comes from I don't know where the jokes come from I don't know how I stand yeah, up there you and know, get the but laughs it's a weird thing of when it when it comes from that place you don't know when you find a new thing isn't it a bit like uh, it's like a high in, a, in like an endorphin what the fuck moment well yeah i i think that i i you know i do what you do and to some degree is that like a lot of times i just have ideas and i'll start talking about them on Good stage time. and wait and hope something's delivered you're literally cornering yourself in in a situation yeah, in front saying, of people yeah that you have to be funny to get out of this yeah and you're saying okay i'm going to go on stage and i'm going to I'm going to find it because you're going to help me find this. Right, right. And if I feel comfortable. And you're going to empower me to break through. Right. And, and if, it's a, if it's an intelligent audience, you're going to help me. And if you're a drunken, late night fucking bridge and tunnel crowd, I'm going to beat my brains out. And it's not. And you're going to end up doing a dick joke. Good that's luck. right. Yeah, that's right. But it's the idea of you're hoping for that moment of, you're going to help me through this. And that's the moment. You know, and then you just hope, like, I hope I can repeat that moment. Big time. I can put that magic in the bottle. <laughs> You know, how, how the fuck do I do that again? I'll be back. Yeah. I can find myself. So are you, are you happy? You're all right? Are you all right? Yeah, really. I mean, uh, divorce it, done, done and, you know, dealt with, with, I mean, I think as much love as we can do with that situation and being around her, being around my kids is really much more like, I love you guys. I live separately, but I'm okay. You know, and how old are your kids? 28 now, uh, 21 almost and 18. So they're old enough to understand. Oh, way, way old enough. And also to know that they're going, you seem better. I mean, like they seem, because I'm not like, hey, you know. They, I mean, it's difficult for them, but they're all like, they've dealt with it. It's, I used to do a, a bit where I'd say, uh, you know, I just, uh, I never recovered from my parents' divorce. I was 35. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it must be, I mean, it must be very hard because, you know, the whole idea of the unit. Yeah. You know, the unit is now two separate units. But if you guys aren't, if there's not hostility and it's done, it's no, done. No, no. I mean, that is pretty amazing on that level and, and you have like, someone new in your yeah, life yeah wonderful person and living here in this you know this place and i'm you know pretty much like okay it's a different game you know the idea of going back out on the road right away no i'm all right right how's now. the heart the heart's good the new the new valve yeah the cow valve which yeah. sounds like a chris walken routine more cow valve but it's like it's working and as someone said, I was talking to somebody saying, like, you realize that you've had so many second chances with, you know, number one, the alcoholism, 
coming out of that, and then the heart surgery and divorce and all these different things going, there's a lot to talk about, my friend. And yeah. And you come out the other side going, what's to be angry about? You're alive, fucker. Right. You know? There was that, because t- I heard you talk about it on uh, Kimmel's show or, or something that, because I noticed it with Letterman, too, is that after his surgery, the vulnerability. Oh, he leaned over to me at one point when we're... Uh, Who, Kimmel? Said, or Letterman? No, Letterman leaned over and said, do you find yourself getting really emotional after this surgery? And I started to go, yeah, I started to cry. <laughs> Did you? And he, yeah, and he, and he said, we're back! And I went, oh, fuck, I'm not going to break down. I'm not going to pour a ball over Walters. But it is, I think, you get more emotional because literally they've cracked the armor. You know, you've all of a sudden, you know, guys are like, fuck you, man, I'm armored up. And then the moment, and they you just seal you open and it's like, literally, you are... You know, you have this scar here that they opened your ass up and literally to the world went inside, fixed the box and then sealed you back up again and said, you're back. You it's know? wild that that box is really is connected to the that, that the heart is really the heart. Huge. And, that. and to that and how how men, I mean, I don't know if women protected as much because they have the fun pillows. But yeah. it's the idea of guys will be like, you know, you'll see a guy on. Uh, Toughen up like that, you know, why are right. like that? The, body, then, the typical body language of when the guys get tense is like, yeah, you yeah, yeah. me. They, they, they suddenly tighten up here and yeah. tighten up and hackles on the neck. Right. right. And then when they crack that open, did, 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 it, did it stay with you? I mean, you are conscious oh, of it? Yeah, you, you're very conscious because there's wires and shit. And you're literally like, you're so vulnerable in a weird way. And the drugs they give you are so powerful that you wake up going, I went, where am I? Cleveland. Why? Yeah. Heart surgery. Oh, oh, fuck yeah. The drug they gave me for the surgery was the drug that Michael was using to sleep on. Right. Michael Jackson was taking propofol as basically for sleeping, and one doctor described this. He said it's like taking propofol for, as a sleep, for sleep disorder is like doing chemotherapy because you're tired of shaving your head. It is so fucking insanely powerful drug that it's designed for surgery. Right. And the no. fact that somebody was administering to this, administering, even though it was a doctor, said you're administering basically the, the most powerful anesthesia there is. Now, did you like before the heart surgery? Were you somebody that was hung up on that, the no. mortality element? Oh like, no! I literally, I went. They found it. I didn't go in going. Yeah, you do. They said, "What are the odds?" I I knew with the doctor I picked that the odds are really great. He'd done four thousand surgeries. All of them had done, have gone well. I didn't know the after surgeries, but the idea that the idea of dying under the knife. With with a valve replacement is really small, but is it there? You go. Yeah, is it possibility? Everybody around me was go like, oh God, you know. I went. I made the choice. Once you make the choice, you've gone like I'm. I'm in. You know, I, this is going to be better because right now I'm flapping in the wind. You know, and the idea of you know, if you ca- didn't have the surgery, then you really are playing dice. You know. So, but when before you had the heart problem, I mean, you, you, you don't seem to me someone who's like morbidly fascinated or no. or, or, or hung up on death. No, so, I mean that's weird. I mean, when I was drinking, there was only one time, even for a moment, where I thought, "Oh fuck, life!" And right. Then I went like, <laughs> then even my conscious brain went, "Did you honestly just say fuck life?" I went, "You know, you you have a pretty good life as it is right now. Have you noticed the two houses? Yes. Have you noticed the uh, the girlfriend? Yes." Uh, you, have you noticed that you know things are pretty good, even though you may not be working right now? Yes. Okay, let's uh, put the suicide over here on discussable. <laughs> let's leave that over here in the, the discussion area. We'll talk about that. Do you, uh, first of all, you don't have the balls to do it. I'm not going to say it out loud. I mean, have you thought about buying a gun? No. What were you going to do? What, like cut your wrist with a water pick? Maybe. So that's erosion. <laughs> what are you thinking about that? So can I put this over here in the what the fuck category yes let's put that over here what the fuck because when, can I ask you what you're doing right now you're sitting naked in a hotel room with a bottle of Jack Daniels yes is, is this maybe influencing your decision possibly okay we're going to put that over here and tomorrow morning and who's that in the bed there I don't know okay well don't discuss this with her because she may tweet it okay this may not be good let's put that over here in the what the fuck category we're going to put that over here Possibly for therapy, if you want to talk about that in therapy, if, or maybe a podcast yeah. two years from now. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it in a podcast? No, I feel safe. Are you ta- you're talking about it in a podcast, I know. Who is this? It's your conscience, asshole. Oh, okay. So, you, have you ever thought about it since then? No. During the surgery, were you thinking about death? No. Why? Because you just were thinking it's gonna, everything's going to be fine. Was that your mother talking? Maybe. She was a Christian scientist who had plastic surgery. Wow. Is that a mixed message? Yeah, that is. Okay. 
Well, we're going to go back to the podcast now because Mark's sitting here. We're talking now. It's going to be, I know I feel like golf commentary, but, you know, look, Tiger's back. Tiger's playing. <laughs> Tiger's doing well. I was hoping that some of the tweets would have golf metaphors like, you know, choke up rather than choke, you know, you know or, or like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you down and putt from the rough. No, no, you didn't say that, you know. It's all good. We're back. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. It's a nice, uh, a nice interval. A nice, a nice interval. interval. Hey, 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 Discussions hey, 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 of death. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's very freeing. Thank you. Yeah, but that, it, I guess it's a little, you know, you've had all this stuff and that you know, there really is a certain degree of like, it doesn't matter. Big time. It just doesn't matter. That's, a, that's the kind of the freedom, the, the ultimate freedom of letting go in a weird way. Like when you talked about all this stuff, you know, the shit that they say about you. And I know it's out there and it used to be, it would, it would immobilize me. And now it would hurt your feelings. Oh, it hurts everything. You just kind of go, well, I shouldn't perform. Then going, no, you love performing. Go out and perform. People will say good things. People will say bad things. It's the nature of the world. It's like you said, if it's like Tina Fey once said, if you're ever feeling really good about yourself, this this thing called the internet. Now at this point in your life, going on stage, being around people you have a good time with, and and seeing people like Pearl, seeing people like Overton. And, and hanging out with friends, and you go, oh, God, and, and hanging with you, even when we're at the comedy cellar, going upstairs and just riffing, go, that's worth it to me more than worrying about, oh, how am I doing? I got the gig. I remember one night sitting with Rodney Dangerfield, and he was, he was <laughs> I think he was doing blow, but he was going, I'm sweating. I don't know why I'm sweating. I own the club. You know, it was like, it's weird. It's crazy. And he said, Robin, when you look in the mirror, how can you say you look normal? <laughs> and at that point, he had like a weird kind of afro, kind of a Jufro yeah, thing yeah, going yeah. on. Rodney, I don't know. Don't tell me it's weird. Yeah. Joe, Joe says I'm a celebrity. My dog's looking at me, and Joe answers said, "Because you're a celebrity, Rodney." But it's that weird thing of you got the gig at this point. I mean, all that other stuff is like, and and you live like a, a person up here. I mean, like you, know, you live like up here because there's no. Uh, well, there's this idea that celebrities like. I mean, there is a rarefied, rarefied air to it because you guys can't hang out with everybody. You can't. But you up here, up and living in Marin, which is kind of like you know, north of San Francisco, is like. The idea, I mean, if there's a paparazzi here, he's, uh, he's, there's one, and I right. don't know where he is, and he's probably wandering around. But it's not ostentatious, it's comfortable, you know. It's comfortable, not- I mean, that's basically life right now. It's the idea of, this is it, I don't need to live, I can't, I mean, I don't do well in L.A. if I was living in a gated community. Yeah. You know, even yeah. though this is down a little hill, and, and but all these people, they've got neighbors, and they've got kids, and they run around, and it's, it's okay. It's like when you go to New York... You know, the moment you walk on the streets in New York, you get good, you get bad. Hey, you suck. I love you. Hey, fuck off. You know, yeah, I ain't yeah. open the door for you. Yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. you. You know, that's the yeah. idea of, where do you live now? Yeah, me? Yeah. I live up in uh, Highland Park. I live uh, in a small two-bedroom uh, cabin-like house overlooking the barrio of East L.A. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and if I, it depends how I, I want people to experience the ride over. If I want them to experience Juarez, I say, come down York. <laughs> <laughs> if I want, if I want, if I want <laughs> if I want them to experience this, the you know, upper middle class. That's for me. It was like when I come to L.A., I had a friend who said, you know, you don't know L.A. except for Beverly Hills and yeah. Bel Air. All of a sudden, you go down lower Melrose and you get into this other area. Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, fucking A, dude. Yeah, it's, it's all That's there. That's where I found this bike shop. I went, this is my shop. Yeah. Single what is that about the bike thing? You spend, How much time you spend in France a year? Oh, I haven't been there in the last since Lance quit, so it's been a while, and since they trashed Floyd, so I haven't been back. But I, I've gone to... Oh, you don't have a house over there or anything? No, never. I Are you not doing the Belzer? No, the bells are yeah, you know, out there. Zool. Yeah, yeah. That's he's a weird a thing. To live in France, I, I don't think I could. I like visiting there. It's Belzer, R. Crumb, and uh, Johnny Depp. That's the expatriate community over there. That's a great my dinner with. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> Fuck, and I. Well, you know, I thank you for the time. I'm glad you're feeling well. Me too, boss, and thanks for coming here. Thanks for making it easier than having to, you know, where are you going? There's a hotel in the city. <laughs> No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Man, yes, we are here. Mr. Mark in the lobby for you. He well, said, come on now. That's what I thought. Like, you know, thank God this is organized. I didn't want to have like a, you know, king of comedy moment where I'm in your house. It's like, <laughs> he's touching everything. Yeah. <laughs> Take care with the fuckers. And just remember, if you want any... Anything WTF related, go to WTFpod.com, get some just coffee.coop, go to punchlinemagazine.com for all your up to date comedy news, like about me interviewing Robin Williams, for instance. That should be there. Try to accept yourselves. It ain't that bad. It's pretty good, actually. It's really fucking good, given that we don't know the alternative. It's kind of a morose ending. I need to eat. <laughs>